So our study this morning is on Matthew chapter 25 concerning the wise and the foolish virgins. And I've, I've entitled this when the lights, when the lights go out. Now, when you read Matthew chapter 25, it says here in verse one to verse four, it says, then shall the kingdom of heaven be like unto 10 virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Let us pray again and ask the Lord for his blessing. Our Father, we try in heaven as we open up your word. Father, we ask for your rich blessings. I ask for your anointing that you may help me to present your word today. That you may be with me, Lord, and cover me with thy presence, that your presence may be seen, Lord, and not me. Please, dear Father, know that we're living in the end time and there are serious, serious days before us and you're seeking to prepare us. Father, anoint your word this morning. Only as you anoint your word can it be heard clearly and your people can be blessed. So have your own sweet way now, we pray. We thank you for hearing our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the, the, the 10 virgins, we know that 10 is a symbol for universality, just like the 10 toes in, in Daniel chapter two. And we know as we study this parable in Matthew chapter 25, that it is speaking about the church, virgins. They are called virgin inspiration says because they profess a pure faith. Christ object lesson page 406. But notice that the Lord says that there are foolish virgins in the church and there are wise virgins in the church. Christ object lesson page 414 says the coming of the bridegroom was at midnight, the darkest hour. It says so the coming of Christ will take place in the darkest period of this earth's history. Notice that the coming of Christ will take place at the darkest period. And we know that today, brethren, we are living in a dark time. As we see the things that are taking place among us, we can see that there's spiritual darkness all over this world. And so we do declare that the things that are taking place Brethren, um, it, it is just not going to get any better. Spiritual darkness is already covering the earth. And this thing will increase unto the time of trouble. But God will be a refuge to his people that trust in him. But brethren, nothing from here on will get easy. Nothing will get easy. Early writings, page 118 says, I saw that the remnant were not prepared for what is coming upon the earth. Stupidity like lethargy seemed to hang upon the minds of those of most of those who profess to believe that we are having the last message. My accompanying angel cried out with awful solemnity, get ready, get ready, get ready for the fierce anger of the Lord is soon to come. Now here inspiration says stupidity like lethargy. Now, that word stupidity, you can substitute the word foolishness. And remember, we are studying the wise and the foolish virgin in Matthew chapter 25. And that word lethargy, it means sluggish, hardly moving. It says in Isaiah chapter 60, verse one, it says, arise and shine for thy light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Now, this is a message for the people of God. Those who have embraced the present truth, the Lord is saying here, arise and shine. Why? Because your light has come. 
The glory of the Lord is the character of the Lord. And this is what the world do not um, understand. The world, they're living in ignorance concerning the true nature and character of our Lord and Savior. And so it says in verse 2, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Notice first that darkness covers the earth. Then it says gross darkness, the people. Now the people here is really speaking about the people of God. Gross darkness, the people. Now for the people of God to be in darkness, that is a tragedy. That is a tragedy. Now notice what it says in Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 12. It says, as a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered. It says, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. So here Ezekiel is saying that the day is a cloudy one and a dark one. And it says that the Lord is seeking out his people. And right now, the Lord is seeking out his people in the church, uh, sealing his people, to save his people. But it is a cloudy day. Now, that word cloudy, it means confusion. The world right now is in confusion. And many in the church are also living in confusion. And this should not be because the Lord has given us his truth. Now, this darkness that is in the world right now, dear friends, it is, it is not a darkness that can be seen. It is a spiritual darkness. And only as we are drawing closer and closer to Jesus can our eyes be, be open to see what is really taking place right now. Matthew 25, verse 3, they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now, dear brethren, um, did you know that with all that is taking place, that the devil's aim is to boycott God's people, to blot out God's people, to pressure the true followers of Christ to yield up their faith. And remember that this darkness that is now prevailing in the world is working parallel with the darkness that is now prevailing in the church. Inspiration says here in Christ subject lesson, page 406. It says, as Christ sat looking upon the party that, was, that, that waited for the bridegroom, he told his disciples the story of the 10 virgins by their experience illustrating the experience of the church that shall live just before his second coming. The two classes of watchers represent the two classes who profess to be waiting for their Lord. They are called virgins because they profess a pure faith. So the experience illustrating the experience of the church just prior to Christ's second coming. And so it is important to have a good understanding of what is really taking place in Matthew chapter 25. Now notice something now, we're, we're gonna look at the, 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 the likeness between the two companies, the, the wise and the foolish virgins. Notice number one, they have the same name, virgin. They wear the same dress. They both have lamps and vessels. They both slumber and sleep, and they're both on the same mission. That is the point of likeness between the two. But this likeness, it is all external, dear friends. There is no inward likeness between the two. The foolish was lacking in inward religion, and no one knew this but the master. Now, what was the difference between the two? What was the difference between the two? As you look at Matthew chapter 25, the difference is the possession of oil. 
That is the mark difference between the two companies. And brothers and sisters, here we are now living in this day and age. And Matthew chapter 25 is telling us that there's something essential that we need to possess for us to make it through this day and age and to make it through what is coming in, in the future. We need the oil. And the foolish was lacking. So the parable reveals the condition of our church today. Now, we know that the world has completely changed. And this change, brethren, has been gradual. Just as darkness gradually settles upon the earth when the sun goes down. This thing has been gradual. We know that in, in important events are taking place right now to bring to pass a new global order. Now we do not know everything that will happen, but whatever happens, we know what it is all leading to. The mark of the beast, a new control system of living. This is leading to tyranny. It is leading to oppression. It is leading to a pressure that it is only as you and I have the oil that will survive. Now, in, in baseball, now you know baseball is one of the main sports in America, one of the biggest sports in America. And there is a, a, a thing that the the, the pitchers use, and it is called a curveball. You know, when the pitcher is seeking to strike out his opponent, he would throw a curveball at them. Now, he would hide that, that ball behind his back. And so no one really knows what is coming. The curveball. Now, when he gets ready to throw that ball, his hand is way out here. And he's just curving. And that ball is heading straight to the man who's there at bat. And, 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 and this ball is just like it's, it's moving in, 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 in the air. The batter doesn't know what is coming. And when he strikes now, he is, it seems as if the ball is right up here and he strikes, but the ball curved to a certain lower level and he gets striked out. And that is what, exactly what the enemy is seeking to do right now. To get us out of the game, to strike us out. And you know that we have received a couple curved balls already. I mean, COVID-19 was indeed a curve ball. No one was looking for that. No one expected it. It hit us by surprise, dear friends, a curve ball. And, and many people have gone down because of it. The lockdown, you never thought that the, this nation would lock down the economy. Curveball, the new vaccine, a different vaccine from any vaccine that have ever uh, been introduced in society, a curveball, the mandates, a curveball, the socialist agenda that has been taking place, all curveballs. And we may not know in full detail what is coming next, but the Lord want us to be prepared. Notice what it says in Country Living, page 10. It says, the work of the people of God is to prepare for the events of the future, which will soon come upon them with blinding force. Now, that's why we use the term curveball. It comes with blinding force. But the Lord would have us to be ready and right now to prepare. And we want to know what all this preparation is all about because you know, there are many things yet to take place. Wars, natural disasters. Virgin, how are you and I to deal with the ever increasing changes that is now taking place in the world? How are we to face the fearful future also? 
pray that God will answer these questions for us as we continue this morning. And so we will look at three things now as we are studying this parable. Number one, the heart of the foolish and the heart of the wise virgins. Number two, preparing for the emergency. There is an emergency that is coming that the Lord would want us to prepare for. And number three, probation will close unexpectedly for the church. Now, when we study Matthew chapter 25, Christ's emphasis was not so much on the details, but on being ready. And being ready. The heart of the, the foolish, we will look at the heart of the foolish now. And we're going to look at the heart of the wise. First, the foolish. Psalms 14 verse 1 says, the fool had said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that do it good. Notice it says the fool said in his heart. Now, the foolish virgins, they believe that God exists. But in their hearts, they live as if God does not care about their sins. They do not highly esteem the present truth. And so Proverbs chapter four, verse 23 says, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Psalms chapter 14, verse two again says, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Notice the fool said in his heart, there is no God, meaning living as if there is no God. And the Bible says they have no understanding. The Lord is looking down from heaven to see who among us really understand and who among us are really seeking God. Daniel chapter 12, verse 10 says, many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Notice the foolish lack understanding, but here we are told that the wise shall understand. Proverbs 14, verse 33 says, wisdom rested in the heart of him that had understanding. So we're looking at the two companies. There's something about the wise friends. They have understanding, but not so the foolish. They're not really seeking God. Notice what it says about wisdom in Proverbs chapter nine. Speaking about the wise virgins now, notice what it says about wisdom. It says wisdom had builded her house. It says she had hewed out her seven pillars. She had killed her beasts. She had mingled her wine. She had also furnished her table. Notice what it says about wisdom. Wisdom is active. Wisdom see the things set before him and he's going forth to do what he needs to do. Wisdom had builded her house. She hewed, she mingled her wine. She furnished her table. She said she sent forth her maidens. So to be wise is to do the things set before us, to work, to prepare. That is wisdom. Wisdom is never idle or lazy. Wisdom never sits at ease. She builds, she heals, she killed her beasts, she mingled her wine, wisdom is active. Wisdom take advantage of every opportunity and is always on the move. And I remember when the Lord was speaking to his disciples at one time, he says, if ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. So Luke chapter 24, verse 25, it says, Then said he unto them, O fools and slow heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So the, the foolish 
They're slow of heart. They're sluggish, slow to believe. They're not moving as they should. There are things that are set before them and they're not preparing, they're not doing. Faith without works is what, dear friends? It is dead, no pep in their step. So what is the remedy for the foolish heart now? Psalms 119 verse 11 says, thy word have I hidden mine heart that I might not sin against thee. This person says in Christ triumphant 358, it is not enough in this time of test and trial to have merely an intellectual knowledge of the truth. Heart work must be done. So there is one thing to have the truth in our minds, in our heart, in our head. But this person says heart work must be done. Early writings, page 118. It says, his wrath is to be poured out on mixed with mercy, and ye are not ready. It says, rend the heart and not the garment. A great work must be done for the remnant. And I pray that the Lord will do this work in you and I, dear brothers and sisters. Because the things that, the, that, that God has revealed to us, we have never, the things that are supposed to happen in the future, we have never gone through anything like this before. So the, 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 we must pray earnestly that the Lord will prepare us. The Lord says we are not ready. A great work must be done. So it says rend the heart. Rend the heart means to get your heart in readiness. See to it that you give your heart to Jesus. Get to know your heart. See if there's any wicked way in you. Rend the heart. That means to repent of your sins. Examine yourself carefully. What God requires is heart work. We are to see to it that we do not have a divided heart, that our hearts are totally surrendered to Christ. And so say, rend the heart and not the garment. In Desire of Ages, page 671, it says, only when the truth is accompanied to the heart by the spirit, will it quicken the conscience and transform the life. So when we read the word of God, we can have an intellectual knowledge, a head knowledge, but it is only the spirit of God that can bring that word to our hearts and transform the life. And that is what we must pray for plead for the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. So let us look at the lamp, the oil, and the vessel that the virgins had in Matthew chapter 25. Verse three said, they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now we want to look at the lamp first, then we'll look at the oil, and then by God's grace, we'll look at the vessel. What is the lamp? Psalms 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now we all know this text. It's a very familiar text, but Jesus, Explain that text in Matthew 5, verse 16. Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. The word is a lamp. Now, when the word is in the heart, good works will shine through the character, which is a light to others. So Jesus says, let your light so shine that men may see. Because men today, they're not really reading the word of God. And so when we have the word of God within us, men will see good works and glorify our heavenly father. And we know, dear friends, that the word will not do us any good 
if it is not in the heart. And so the lamp then must be a symbol of the heart into which the word of God is being retained. So when, as we study Matthew chapter 25 now, there is a present truth lesson here. But we want to look at the spiritual application and then look at the, 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 the meaning or the present truth lesson for this day and age for the church. So again, the lamp must be a symbol of the heart into which the word of God is being retained. Now, the oil, let us look at the oil. Exodus chapter 30, 30 verse 25 says, and thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment. An ointment compound after the art of the apothecary, it shall be an holy anointing oil. So this oil was a holy anointing oil that, that was used to anoint the, the priests that were to minister before the Lord. Verse 30 says, and thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. So the oil is a symbol we know of the Holy Spirit. And whosoever, again, were to minister before God was to be anointed with the holy oil. We cannot minister without the Holy Spirit. And so we have the illustration also in Zechariah chapter four, in verse two, where it says, you know, I saw a golden candlestick. And that golden candlestick was being fed with oil. And as, as we continue to Zechariah chapter four, verse six, it says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, say the Lord. So the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus is declared to be the Messiah. Now that word Messiah also means anointed. Jesus was anointed, we know, with the Holy Spirit. And we have it here in Isaiah 61, verse one. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Now let's look at this symbol, this illustration quickly. You know, we have what is called crude oil, raw oil. And from that oil, you know, that oil, when they take that, that crude oil, it is heated in a, in, a, um, in a chamber. And when that oil is e heated in a chamber, then it produces different forms of gas. Now that gas is fuel for your car, fuel for the airplane, fuel for your diesel engine, your fuel and energy. So without oil, the cars are not gonna run. The airplane is not gonna fly. There's no fuel, there's no energy. And so this is the lesson that if we are to have energy, spiritual energy, spiritual life, in this day and age that we're living in, we need the oil, Virgin. We are in desperate need of the Holy Spirit. Take this illustration and let us see our desperate need of the Holy Spirit. The world need oil, need energy. We need the Spirit of God in our lives. So we must plead for the Spirit. And that is the lesson here in Matthew chapter 25. The foolish. They went out without the oil. And so we think about the pressures now in life. Think about the stress, the distress, the, the trouble, the trials, the oppression, the difficulty that we face now. How are we to deal with this? Only as we have the Holy Spirit. You see, the engines will not work, dear friends, without the lubrication of oil. And we, we too are like uh, engines, you would say. And without the spirit of God in us, the pressure of life is going to break us. 
the stress of life is going to break us. Now think about the pressure and the stress that is coming because the Bible tells us that a time of trouble is coming like never before. A trouble that we have never experienced before is coming. And without the spirit of God, there is no way of dealing with it. As a matter of fact, without the spirit of God now, the little trials that we face will take us out. So brethren, we need to plead. I'm saying if you will not plead for the spirit of God in your life, I mean, plead for him in my life because I need him. Friends, I need the spirit of God. And so we see what the lamp represents now. We see what the oil represents. And in a minute or so, we're going to look at what the vessel represents. Again, these symbols, they're all pertaining to different aspects of the individual spiritual life. The oil, the lamp, and the vessel. Brethren, it is possible to have the word of God in you and then lose the word by negligence. The cares of this life, we are told, can choke the word. It is possible to have the spirit of God at one point in your life and then lose the Holy Spirit. It is possible. I remember, look at uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 26. If you have Bibles, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 26. It is possible to have the spirit of God at one point in your life and to lose the Holy Spirit. We must plead each day for, for refreshing, for new grace, for God's blessing. Notice what happened to a man by the name of Saul. You remember what happened with Saul. God anointed Saul with the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, Saul prophesied. But Saul lost his hold upon God. The advantages that God gave to him, he did not take these things seriously. And he erred greatly. He began to, to, to chase after David, wanted to kill the man. Uh, uh, jealousy and envy and all these things. Notice what happened in, in 1 Samuel chapter 26 now. At verse 21, you know, what happened here was that David saw him, saw Saul, and David had the opportunity to take Saul's life. But David never raised his hand to do that wicked work. And Saul understood this. And notice what he said. Verse 21. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. Notice the confession of this man. This man confessed that he have played the fool. And he erred exceedingly. It is possible to have the spirit of God at some point and then to lose. We must constantly pray. We must seek God earnestly. Study his word. Be zealous for the glory of God. Philippians chapter 2 now, verse 14 says, says, do all things without murmuring and disputing, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Now again, the oil is, is the influence of the Holy Spirit. The lamp of the heart is to be fed by the holy oil. 
by the Spirit. And so we see now what this all translate um, into. It, it actually translates to the, 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 the spiritual life of the individual. The oil working in the heart, working with the word of God in the heart, translate to the spiritual life of the individual. The spiritual life that is nourished and made visible to the world as light. So when we say that the lamp is a symbol of the word of God in the heart now, again, it boils down to a Christ-like character. Christ-like life in us, sustained again by the Holy Spirit. And so again, the word must be in us. We must con constantly study and ask God to give us understanding of what we study to give us clearness of mind. And notice it says here that we are to hold forth the word of life. We must shine as lights in the world only as the word is in us. Now we look at the lamp, we look at the oil. Now we want to look at the vessel. What does the vessel symbolize? Isaiah chapter 52, verse 11 says, The party, the party, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Again, dear friends, we're looking at the spiritual application before we look at the present truth application. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 20 says, And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering. Unto the Lord out of all nations, upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules, and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, said the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. So the vessel is a symbol of us. And we are to be what now? A clean vessel, pure, holy for God. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, we're still looking at the vessel. It says, for God who commanded the light now to shine out of darkness, had shined where now in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He says, but we have this treasure now. In what kind of vessel? In earthen vessels or clay vessel, we were made out of clay, earthen vessels. He says, we have this treasure. What kind of treasure do we, do we have? Jesus Christ himself. Do you have this treasure, dear friends? Jesus Christ himself, we have this treasure in earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us again. The lamp is the word of God in the heart. Notice carefully now, the vessel is us. We are vessels. Now, notice if we study a prophecy and the prophecy has not yet taken place, yet the word that we study is in us, the vessel, waiting for the time when the prophecy will be uh, a reality. Now, when the prophecy begins to take place, the word that is in us, that is the vessel, the word that is in us is now applied to the heart by the Holy Spirit to give us grace and strength at the time that the prophecy is being now fulfilled. That's what it means. So we must bring these symbols together to see the present truth application now for our time. So we study the prophetic word, but the prophecy is yet future. It's not taking place as yet. But when the prophecy begins to take place, we need grace for when these things are happening. And then the words that we have studied, the spirit of God now will apply it. 
and give us that strength. And so we have the symbols of the lamp, the oil, and the vessel. So we're talking now about the prophetic knowledge. Prophetic knowledge. When the wise poured that extra oil into their lamps, it's because the, the oil that was in the lamp was getting empty and it needed to be replenished so the light could continue to shine. Now, those who have learned uh, to know Jesus Christ, those who have been taught by Jesus Christ, they do possess a clearness of knowledge which makes them light bearers in the world. And I, I say this humbly now, that if we are true to Jesus, dear friends, and true to the position in which the, the Lord has placed us, we shall not be ashamed to say that we believe ourselves to know the truth for this time. Why? Because he has given to us an understanding, an understanding of the all important subjects of the gospel and salvation. And we are to have knowledge of the prophecies also the present truth so the prophetic knowledge let us apply now this uh, and see what the present truth lesson is for us today as a people so the oil in the lamp a time will come when the oil in the lamp will will burn out and it will need to be replenished so the oil in the lamp must be truth in action. And the truth that we have been studying and from the beginning of our church, when our church was, when our church came on the scene was the, the, the message of the judgment of the dead. We understand that in 1844, that Christ began to judge the cases of the dead. We know that from studying the 2300 day prophecy and that we are now living in the antitypical day of atonement. When we study Leviticus chapter 16 and Leviticus chapter 23, we, we see there what happened in the day of atonement. We are now living in that true day of atonement, which began in 1844. Christ is now judging the cases of the dead and soon will he begin to judge the cases of the living. So the oil in the vessel must represent the message of the judgment of the living, an additional truth to go into action when that time begins. You know what Inspiration says? Great controversy, page 609. It says different periods in the history of the church have each been marked by the development of, of some special truth adapted to the necessities of God's people at that time. Now you must agree that we are in a, a, a different period in the history of the church. Brethren, we are in a different period. And the time is coming when the judgment of the living will begin. And we know that the judgment of the living uh, speaks about the sealing of the 144,000, the purification of the church, judgment that begins in the house of God, a separation that is about to take place in God's church. And if the, in the judgment of the dead, we know that the Lord is blotting out the names of those who are not saved. It is a literal work of the blotting out of the names. Now, with the living church, there also must be a separation. A blotting out of those who have not the spirit of God in their life. Those who are not living a Christ-like life by his grace. And so it says, now every new truth has made its way against hatred and opposition. Those who were blessed with his light were tempted and tried. The Lord 
gives a special truth for the people in an emergency. Notice that word emergency. Who dares, dare refuse to publish it. And so here we are, we are, we are, we are approaching a crisis. That crisis is the judgment of the living that is right upon us. And so when the cry was made in Matthew chapter 25, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The Bible said that all 10 virgins see that their light, the light of their lamps were going out. And that means that the judgment of the dead message was passing. And so quickly the, the wise began to refill their lamps. That is now the truth that they have studied the truth that they have studied concerning the judgment of the living. The spirit of God now begins to quicken them, begin to fuel their faith and, and to give them the ability that they needed to go on. So we need to understand that message. So we come to our second head quickly, preparing for the emergency. Matthew 25, verse six, and at midnight there was a cry made, behold, the bridegroom coming, Go ye out to meet him. We said already that, you know, that, that in 1844, the judgment of the dead began. But notice this statement in Review and Herald, August 19th, 1890. Hear what inspiration says? It says here, I'm often referred to the parable of the 10 virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. It says, this parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. Notice, has been, 1844. And it says, and will be, that's future, to the very letter. It says, for it has a special application to this time. And like the third angel's message has been fulfilled, notice, and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. In the parable, the 10 virgins had lamps, but only five of them had the saving oil with which to keep their lamps burning. So this is the matter, dear friend. It is to have the saving oil, the spirit of the living God. And it is the spirit of God that seals us. The saving oil. Without the spirit, we cannot live a holy life. We cannot understand the word of God. The word will be in our head only. It will not be in our heart. We need the Holy Spirit. Now we're looking at the emergency now. Again, this emergency that is coming is the judgment of the living. Now we know that the mark of the beast is coming. We know wars are coming. We know uh, certain events uh, like these will take place. But the event that we need to prepare for is the judgment of the living. What is an emergency? An emergency is a serious, unexpected, and often dangerous situation requiring immediate action. That is an emergency. Now, when this emergency comes upon the foolish virgins, it requires immediate action, but they will have no oil to supply their needs. See, right now, as we live, we think tomorrow will happen just as today. But every event that is now taking place, brethren, should be stirring our souls. Every event that we are seeing taking place now should be a means of stirring us to be ready because we see that we're now living in a different time, an end time. The foolish lack the golden oil, the saving oil, the anointing oil, the oil of understanding, the all important prophetic oil, they lack this. And so their lamps went out into darkness. I would ask the question, have you this oil, the spirit of the living God in you? Again, in 1844, the judgment of the dead 
began. Remember that William Miller prior to 1844 was declaring the first angel's message. Fear God and give glory unto him for the hour of his judgment is come. The, the hour of his judgment is come. That's when Jesus entered into the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. And so friends, we're living in the true day of atonement. And so this dark place right here that you see on the chart, that is where we are right now. The midnight cry, sounding loud and clear in our ears to behold the bridegroom coming. Remember it says that all 10 virgins slumbered and slept, but now the wise virgins are awakening because they know that the judgment of the living is right upon us, that events are taking place leading up to it. The judgment of the living message again, remember, is concerning the sealing of the 144,000, which is a literal number. Only they in the church will receive the seal while millions will be stamped with that awful stamp, foolish virgins. So right now we are in the developing time for the 10 virgins. God is still working upon hearts. Serious events are now taking place. Lord, help us to be prepared. Great Controversy, page 490 says, solemn are the scenes connected with the closing work of the atonement. Momentous are the interests involved therein. It says the judgment is now passing in the century above. It is now. It says for many years this work has been in progress, but soon, none know how soon it will pass to the cases of the living. And so we must get uh, uh, past the place of um, preparing to the place of being prepared. That is it, friends. We must get to the place of watching and waiting, prepared, readiness. Christ Subject Lesson, page 406 says, the 10 maidens seize their lamps and begin to trim them in haste to go forth. He says, but five have neglected to fill their flax with oil. They did not anticipate so long a delay, and they have not prepared for the emergency. They have not prepared. Verse Matthew chapter 25, verse 7 says, then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And I pray that we are trimming our lamps. Seeing to it that our hearts are right with God. Christ subject lesson page 412 says, it is in a crisis that it is, it is in a crisis that character is revealed. Amen. When the crisis come, we must be ready. It is in a crisis that character is revealed. When the earnest voice proclaim at midnight, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And the sleeping virgins were, were, were roused from their slumbers. It was seen who had made preparation for the event. It says both parties were taken unawares. But one was prepared for the emergency. And the other was found without preparation. I notice carefully now. Events are, go are, are going to break out suddenly. We know that. More serious events, we know, are coming. And again, we don't have all the details of every single thing that will happen. There are certain things that may just surprise us again. But this judgment of the living that is coming, friends, it says both parties were taken unawares, meaning it happened so suddenly, unexpectedly. But one was prepared. What made them ready? Having the oil, the Holy Spirit. In other words, day by day, they were pleading with God for the Spirit. That God will fill their hearts with his love, with his grace. They knew they have no strength. 
and that each day they need God's spirit. There must be grace in our souls. Grace to meet again this unescapable time that is coming. John chapter 14, verse 26. Notice something here. It says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, what I have said unto you. All things, notice the comforter. <laughs> in this day of pressure and trial, our friends, you need comfort. In other words, you need the spirit of God. Notice, he shall teach you all things. That is all things that pertain to life and godliness. In other words, even the things that are taking place right now, COVID-19, the socialism agenda, the spirit of God will give us understanding of what they really mean. We may not understand all the full details of, 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 of the pandemic, who caused it and so on, but the Lord will give us an understanding of, of, of what they really mean spiritually. With all the money printing that is going on and the inflation, these things are baffling so many people, but God will give us an understanding and let us know, yes, it is because they're trying to devalue the money and bring in a new system. He will give us the, the, the spiritual understanding of what they mean. We are on the, the borders of the crisis. And so friends, he shall teach us all things. The oil in the lamp will soon run low and must be replenished by the oil in the vessel. We will be astonished at what is going on. We will murmur. We will complain at what the government is doing if the Holy Spirit is not within us to comfort us and to give us an understanding. And so the Lord continues and he says here, peace I leave with you. He says, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world give it, give I unto you. Then the Lord says here, let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Again, pressure, pressure. More pressure is coming. The darkness that is in the world is running parallel with the darkness that is in the church. And so the time will come when at last the, the, the foolish virgins will arouse themselves, they will be startled. Their conscience will be wide awake, but too late. Now, when a man is under pressure, he say things like, uh, you know, I don't know how much more of this thing I can take. When a man is under pressure, he says things like, this thing is just overwhelming. I can't handle it. That's what pressure does. But the comforter will give you grace through it, friends. The comforter will give you grace. Brethren, as we study this parable in Matthew chapter 25, the one thing that is needful, the one thing that is necessary, the one thing that God wants us to know and understand is how much we need the Holy Spirit. Brethren, we need to understand that the Spirit of God is our life now. The Spirit brings the presence of Jesus to our souls. We need the Holy Spirit. And our hearts will be troubled. We will be afraid. We will have no comfort without him. Let not your heart be troubled, said Jesus. Plead for the Spirit of God. Acts chapter 19, verse 2. A very important question was asked. He said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be an Holy Ghost. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? That is the question. Brethren, have you? 
Have I? Have we received the spirit of God since we believe? Now, it doesn't mean that we will have some ecstatic feelings. No, it means that we will have grace on the trial. It means that we, have, we will have an understanding, clearness of mind. We will see Jesus. We will love the Lord. We will shine as lights for him. Have we received the Holy Spirit since, since we believe? I noticed something now in John chapter 20. Turn with me to John chapter 20 in your Bible. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. We're going to read verse, verse 22. You know, after Jesus, uh, after his death and resurrection, he appeared unto his disciples. And he said in verse 22, let's read from verse 21. He says here, then said Jesus unto them, peace be unto you. As my father had sent me, even so sent I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. The one thing Christ desires for us, friends, the Holy Ghost. He says, receive the Holy Ghost. And so the, the, the virgins now, the foolish virgins, when the emergency hit them by surprise and they, are, they arose out of their slumber, they look on their lamps and they said, our lamps are gone out. Then they said unto the, to the wise, give us of your oil. For our lamps have gone out. Brethren, let this parable have its full and solemn weight with you. These foolish virgins had oil at one point and they had light. But the oil failed by their own fault. And so their, their, their light went out. And they were startled. And when they awoke from their slumber to see that instead of a, a bright flame, there was nothing but smoke. Smoke, dear friends. Virgin, we may live and our life may drift into a low ebb. And that is the condition of the church right now. Virgin, it is possible to run in the paths of righteousness and slip and fall, never to rise again. It is possible. So remember what, what, what Paul said to the Galatians, Ye did run well. What hindered you? Is there anything that is hindering us? What can it be, dear friends? Our lamps are gone out. Think about a car. You know, you're trying to drive. You're trying to get to a certain destination. And then the oil in your car fails. The engine will go to pieces. It will not crank. It will leave you there in the dark with your lamps all gone out. Friends, the judgment of the dead message is almost over. In other words, what Jesus is doing in the sanctuary above concerning the cases of the dead is almost complete. Soon will the living here be tried. That message is going on E, and we will need to replenish it with the judgment of the living message. As long as we understand the judgment for the living and of Christ and the Holy Spirit in our hearts. By his grace, we will make it through. Let us study the word. And if you do not understand what the judgment of the living message is all about, ask somebody. Inquire. Seek to know this thing. God will not hide from any one of us the things that are needful at this time. And so, friends, when prophecy begins to fulfill itself, beyond the understanding of the foolish virgins, they will be alarmed. They will cry out, our lamps are gone out. They will see the events of the gospel taking shape, or should I say shaping themselves contrary to their expectations. And they will become confused and they will see themselves in darkness.
you know, have been driving before um, in, in, in a different state and driving in the, in the night, in the dark, on a lonely road, dear friends. And I'm saying to the Lord, Lord, don't let this car stop on me. Don't let this thing stop on me, Lord. Please bring me to my destination. It is an awful thing to be in the dark. Sister White says in the Testaments of the Church, Volume 5, page 217, the church has turned back from following Christ, our leader, and is steadily retreating towards Egypt. He says that few are alarmed or astonished at their want of what now? Spiritual power. Spiritual power is the power of righteousness, the power of holiness, that if anyone does something uh, horribly wrong to you, you can still love them still. If anyone do you harm, you have the spiritual power to love them still. That is power, that is grace. That when the pressures of life are upon you, you're not complaining, you're not murmuring. That is spiritual power. That you're not arguing with one another, you're not fighting with one another. That in the midst of persecution, in the midst of trial, in the midst of oppression, you're loving, you're blessing. As Jesus, when he was upon the cross, and when they were doing him harm, the greatest harm, he looked upon them with love and compassion. And he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, spiritual power. Our lamps are gone out. Now, brethren, when those lamps went out, it didn't happen suddenly. I don't believe it happened suddenly. It was a slow process. The flame does not all die out into darkness in a minute. They are stages in this death. It is just like a, a fatal wound. And when you shoot an animal and the blood begins to flow out by slow degrees, little by little, a slow death. That is what is happening now with many in our church. Many among us, even some among us who profess to believe the present truth. They have a head knowledge, but there's no heart work. These five foolish virgins, brethren, they did not stray away into any forbidden paths. The Bible did not say that they were junkards. It did not say that they were adulterers or fornicators. It did not say that they were thieves. There was no positive sin that was witnessed against them. They were just simply asleep. The other five were asleep too, but they awoke out of their sleep. They awoke out of their sleep, man. Virgin, we need to awake. Look at the things that are happening right now. Virgin, we need to awake out of our sleep. There's an emergency that's coming upon the church and upon the world too. But first, the church, we need to get our lives in order, get our houses in order. Virgin, awake to your need of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. That is, a, that is a wedding bell, friends. It is a wedding bell, but uh, it was a wedding bell to the wise, but it was a funeral knell to the foolish. Now, these foolish virgins, they were, not, they were not enemies of the bridegroom. They thought that they were his friends. They thought that, that, that they were friends of Christ. But they let the golden opportunity slip them. They let the golden opportunity pass without securing the one thing that was needed. The lamps, our hearts must be stored with the word, and the spirit of God working with that word in us. And we must have extra oil. The message of the judgment of the living within us, ready to go into action when that time comes. What caused the dying out of the lamps, dear friends? Negligence, drowsiness, foolishness, sluggishness. Negligence, darkening into drowsiness, man. 
That's what caused the, 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 the dying out of the land. They did not deliberately say, I am not going to take any oil with me. They were just, they just neglected to do so. Something else was preoccupying their minds. And you know, there's so much things right now in this world to, to preoccupy our minds. It can be work. Virgin, you can, you can be working too much and not giving yourself the prayer and meditation. You can be causing the things that are taking place in this world to occupy your minds too much and you're not spending time in prayer, pleading for the spirit of God. These foolish virgins, they simply did not have the vision to look ahead and provide against this long delay of the bridegroom. Virgin, if we do not look forward and prepare as the Bible has already outlined for us and telling us that a time of trouble is coming such as never before, if we continue as normal, we will be swept away by the things that are taking place now. No spirit, no power. No spirit, no energy. No spirit, no strength. Testimonies to the Church, volume 2, page 123 says, it is not for lack of knowledge that God's people are now perishing. They will not be condemned because they do not know the way, the truth, and the life. Notice now. It says the truth that has reached their understanding, their minds, <laughs> the light which has shone on their soul, but which has been neglected or refused will condemn them. I would ask the question, is there any truth, dear friends, that you are actually neglecting right now? Any truth that you are refusing right now? That you are taking for granted? Anything that God has revealed to us in the spirit of prophecy? Uh, the sanctuary truth, the health message, the uh, country living? Remember when God said to his people, his disciples, when he was here, he says, when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, he says, flee, flee to the mountains. Now, if they had neglected to do what Jesus outlined, my question is, would that truth have condemned them? Yes, friends. If we know certain truths and we neglect or we refuse because of whatever reason, it will not be a pretty situation for us. And so here the Bible says now, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19, quench not the spirit. That is what happened with the foolish virgins. They quenched the spirit. How did they quench the spirit? They despised prophesying. Notice now, quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. In other words, the foolish virgins, they are not proving all things. They're not studying for themselves. They're not even holding fast that which is good, that which they know to be good. But if we say that a message has come to the church, the message of the judgment for the living, many will not even try and look into it and inquire concerning it. They will not prove all things. And so they are quenching the spirit. Then it says, abstain from all appearance now of evil. Foolish virgins are asleep. They're asleep. And so they said to the wise, give us of your oil. Wow, what a request. And you would say, you know, that's a, you know, look, if somebody asks something from you, you should give it to them. So they said to the wise, give us of your oil. And you, you would think that the wise, they're so kind, they're so loving, they're like Jesus. Yes, my brother, take some of this oil. Help yourself. Oh, no. Remember, the oil translate to character. The oil in the heart, working with the word of God, translated to character. 
the character that shines in the dark. Brethren, be sure that nobody was more surprised than were the five foolish women when they opened their sleepy eyes and saw the state of things. And so the scripture says, let your loins be always be girt about and your lamps burning and ye yourselves like unto men which wait for the coming of your Lord. Think about the shock that took place with these virgins, the, the alarm, their bewilderment. It is all expressed in that statement, give us of your oil. And so the answer of the wise, you may say, you know, it was a cold answer. It was a cold answer. Verse nine in Matthew chapter 25 says, but the wise answered saying, not so, not so. The oil friends that belong to me can't be given to you. If you have oil, you cannot give it to someone else. This character, and moral character or spiritual gifts cannot be transferred to anybody. And so in Proverbs chapter nine now, hear what it says in Proverbs, Chapter 9, verse 12, it says, if thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself. You cannot give your wisdom to another. It takes years to develop Christ-like character by his grace. You cannot transfer that to any family member. But it says, but if thou scornest, thou alone shall bear it. And so the wise said, not so. Stop them dead in their tracks. Not so, brother. Lest there be not enough for us and you. You cannot share your brother's oil. You may share uh, many of his possessions, but not this. Virgin, you can share my car. I can share my, my food with you. Give you some of, my, some of my rice and peas and tofu and all of that. But I can't give you the oil. God alone, by his Holy Spirit, can give that to you. And it is available now. So the Bible says, they said, go to them that sell and buy for yourselves. I mean, what are they going to find in the, in the middle of the night here? What shop will be open at midnight? But they risked it. <laughs> they went. And they came back. It was too late. Go to them that sell. Buy for yourselves. In other words, we must read for ourselves. We must study for ourselves. We must believe for ourselves and not for another. We can encourage a man. We can try to help them in many ways, but they must believe. You must believe for yourselves. Take time to pray for yourself. Spend that quality time with Christ now, dear friends. Now, I, I, I do not say now that there is no such thing as coming to Jesus Christ in the last hours of life. I do not say that, you know, and, and, and becoming ready to enter in even at that time. But I do say that it is very rare, friends. It is a very rare thing. Look at the thief on the cross. That is a rare case. You want to risk that? No, friends. It is very rare. And keep in mind also that this parable is addressed not to the people in the world now, but to those who profess to know Jesus, to the people, our brothers and sisters in the church. Day by day, dear friends, we must go to Christ, buy for ourselves, without money now, or without price, buy for ourselves. What makes readiness? The lamp and the oil and the vessel. Moral character makes readiness. The kind that is to shine in the world's darkness. Heavenly temper, heavenly conduct, holiness, righteousness. That is what makes readiness. Now, readiness is not knowing everything. Notice, it is really um, using well 
and things that you already know. I remember the Bible says that whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Am I living a life that is a light in the world is the question. Am I adding to the darkness or am I a light? The wise virgins had lamps that were shining bright, brightly, oh so bright. Is this my condition? I praise God that there is, there is still time, you know? There is time to truly surrender all to him. Inspiration says here in Testament of the Church, volume six, page 90. Now, I don't want anyone to be discouraged now. Be encouraged, dear friends, that Jesus is still here for you. The Spirit of God is still here. Oh, friends, be encouraged. Be encouraged that you still have hope. But I would have everyone to be awakened by God's grace to the times that we're living in and how close we are. It says that the Holy Spirit will come to all who are begging for the bread of life to give to their neighbors. That's the thing. You're begging for the Spirit of God, not just for yourself, man but that you may have something to give to your neighbors. Begging. So we can't just indulge ourselves now. We can't just come and rejoice in the, in the message and rejoice in the truth. We must be up and about our Lord's business. There are men and women that are dying out there begging for bread to give it to others. Let us notice something here. In Luke chapter 11, why, I want to ask the question, why is it that some have not the Holy Spirit? Let us see if we can answer that question in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. And let us read from verse 9. It says, if you're there with me, Luke chapter 11, I'm going to read from verse 9. Says, and I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receive it, and he that seeketh, find it, and to him that knocketh, it, it shall be opened. Notice verse 11. It says, If a son shall ask bread of any of you, that is what now a father, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Verse 11 says, verse 12 says, or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? That is it. If we ask, but you may say, I've been asking, you know, and, and, and I'm still lacking so much. But notice something about this child in verse 11. If a son shall ask a bread, if a son shall ask for bread. My question is, why did the son ask for bread? It's because he was hungry. If we hunger, we will ask, we will plead, we will beg. And God will feed us, dear friends. The child asked because he was hungry. And many of us, sometimes it's just that we're not hungry. If we are hungry, man, oh, we want to satisfy that hunger. If that pain is gnawing upon us, we will seek to replenish our souls. Hunger. The church is not hungry. That is the problem. Probation, dear friends, will close unexpectedly. And so there must be readiness of standing. We must be complete in Christ. By grace, you are saved. There must be readiness of clothing. We are to have on the fine linen, clean and white, Christ's righteousness. There must be readiness of heart and soul. We must have the spirit dwelling in us and sealing us. Oil not only in our lamps, but oil in our vessels. The Holy Spirit himself. Be ye therefore ready. Notice as we try to bring it to a close now, it says the class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They have a regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth. 
They are attracted to those who believe the truth, but they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit working. They have not fallen upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and permitted their old nature to be broken up. If you know that the old nature is still within you, if you're still angry, you still are, you're easily agitated, upset. The pressures are upon you. If you know that you, you, you have the old nature within you, why don't you fall upon the rock? Take time and plead, pass and pray, ask God for help. Let the self-life bleed out, dear friends. Ask the Lord for help. It says, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. That is the, the crooks, dear friends, of the matter. They went in with him. Why? Because they were always with him. If you were with him now, oh yes, you will be with him then. They were always with him. And it says, and the door was shut. That shut door represents the closing of probation for the church, not the world now. Judgment begins in the house of God, closing of probation for the church. This is not the coming of Jesus in the cloud. This is not the second coming. Because notice verse 11 says, when the door was shut, it says, afterward came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. So when Christ comes the second time, he, time, he take us up into heaven. There's no time for anybody else to come after. Take us up. The wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. So this is an event that is about to take place in our church, the closing of probation. The emergency is coming. And after a while, they came and said, Lord, Lord, open to us. Oh, here is late prayer. Here is earnest prayer now, because they're saying, Lord, Lord. But it is late prayer. It is not the prayer of faith. It is a prayer when a man knows that he just knows that he's, he's lost. And verse 12 says, but he answered and said, verily I say unto you, I know you not. So he says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the son of man cometh. So the door was shut, dear friends. Door was shut. Where are we, my dear brothers and sisters? Pray that the Lord will seal us with that wonderful stamp. Seal us with the Holy Spirit. Christ says, I know you not. And so in closing, in closing, darkness is over the earth right now. And the darkness is increasing. But there's gross darkness in the church. Friends, gross darkness in the church. We are now in the sealing time. Judgment for the living will soon be over. Probation will soon close. The sealing will soon be complete. Judgment for the living will begin. God will separate the righteous from the unrighteous among us. Seal his people, empower them with gospel power, the Pentecostal power, and they will go forth to proclaim the everlasting gospel, the loud cry. May God help us. May he give us grace. Let us pray.